Good morning, everybody. My name is Willeke Wendrich. I'm the director of the Coatsen Institute of Archaeology, and I welcome you uh, at this beginning of 2021, although it's already February. Um, we have uh, our first public lecture, but I also want to do a brief announcement for an event we have tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow at 11 a.m. we have another event of the team Friends of Archaeology. Uh, Stephen Mandel, who's an Irish archaeologist, will discuss the mysterious megalithic passage tomb at Newgrange. Uh, so it will be a very exciting lecture specifically for any teens that you might know. So if you have children, grandchildren, neighbors, friends of grandchildren or neighbors or children, um, invite them. Uh, they, they can participate in these events. Uh, there will be posted in the chat the link uh, where you can uh, subscribe to tomorrow's event. Um, it is a distinct pleasure for me to introduce Stephen Acabado. Uh, he's one of our stars at the Coatesen Institute of Archaeology. He's an associate professor in the Department of Anthropology uh, and a core faculty member of the uh, interdepartmental program in archaeology at the Coatesen Institute. Uh, he's also linked to Asian languages and cultures. He is working in the Philippines, and that's what his lecture is about today. Uh, his main interest, and, and that's something that is increasingly important in archaeology, is the relation with the indigenous people, and especially the effect of colonialism on indigenous populations, but also on archaeology and how archaeologists have interacted with local populations. So his lecture today uh, will focus on the three age chronology, the Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age. Uh, this is something that archaeology has worked with for a long time, but it was um, something that was developed in Scandinavia and then just adopted for the entire world. And we really need to ask ourselves if this is reasonable, if this fits. Uh, and Underlying, of course, is this tacit idea that this is a progression from using stone to using bronze to using iron. Uh, and of course, the last phase, this is the best, most civilized phase. Th that is sort of the underlying narrative, which is very problematic. Uh, if I talk about my own region, ancient Egypt, we know that um, stone knives were used until uh, the very latest phases of Egyptian civilization, and they were superior to anything metal. So there, there's a lot of ideas that don't quite fit. So without further ado, I want to give the floor to Stephen Acabado. Thank you for presenting to us today. Thank you, Lilica, Dr. Vendrich. Uh, that actually sums up my presentation today. Uh, but thanks for the invitation uh, to deliver this public talk. Thank you also to Michelle, Jacobson, and Deirdre Brin for help with logistic, logistical preparation for this presentation. This talk summarizes the paper that, that Dr. Grace Barreto Tesoro and I co-wrote for a forthcoming Philippine reader. Unfortunately, it is 3 a.m. in the Philippines right now, so Grace is unable to join us, but I'm sure she will be watching this recording later. Of course, I would like to thank everyone for joining us. It's always an honor to share our work to the wider community, especially since the topic of our presentation includes community engagement and inclusivity. Since the emergence of archaeology as an academic discipline, many archaeologists have attempted to describe cultures through typological terms, particularly based, based on lithics and our ceramics sometimes appearing to conflate artifact features with ethnicity. The apparent arbitrariness of such models thus results in points of contention among archeologists. In the Philippines, these debates are compounded by the imposition of the European tree aid system and overall lack of data that can facilitate the development of a robust 
cultural chronology. Our main goal in writing this paper is to reflect on our positionality and contributing to a better understanding of the history of the diverse populations of the Philippines and provide our ideas on what it means to decolonize archaeology. As a discipline with a long tradition of relying on technological change and social complexity to describe change, we get into the trap of classifying cultures into stages of development or worse, as mentioned a while ago, conflating artifact features and ethnicity. This presentation thus aims to provide a venue to discuss the need to integrate available data sets on Philippine archaeology that focuses on behavioral rather than typological models. This is an attempt to break the boundary between archaeology and history, as well as integrate Philippine chronology with the wider Southeast Asian regional chronology by using standard historical periodization. We recognize that the archipelagic nature of the country makes chronology building complicated, but it is important that models characterize regional and inter-regional patterns. And although this is a paper on cultural chronology building, the available radiocarbon dates available from intact context so far are not sufficient to facilitate discussions about statistical modeling. However, the first step to achieve a Philippine-centric chronology is to abandon the European pre-aid system, as this model does not describe the Philippine experience. We propose a periodization that is developed from within, through the unpacking of oral histories and the inclusion of indigenous epistemologies in the interpretation of the archaeological record. Doing so will break regional and, and, and disciplinary boundaries that has characterized Philippine archaeology so far. The absence of architectural monuments and pre-colonial state level societies meant that the foundation of the archaeology of the Philippines was different from other Southeast Asian countries where the interest in archaeology predated the arrival of Europeans and European scholarship in the region. This is exemplified by analysis of stone inscriptions to reconstruct political and economic transformations of earlier states that were sponsored by Thai and Burmese rulers. Post Angkorian inscriptions in Angkor Wat also describe restoring Angkor to the past glories. The, the practice of formal archaeology, however, started with European colonization of Southeast Asia. French, British, and Dutch archaeologists is perheaded the antiquarian period in Southeast Asian archaeology by collecting artifacts from the region meant for museum collections in Europe. These archaeological projects resulted in the establishment of archaeological institutions that have a lasting influence on the practice of archaeology in Southeast Asia. These works have also affected the development of the concept of cultural heritage in, in Southeast Asian archaeology a significant emphasis was focused on discovering and documenting ancient monuments uh, like Angkor, Prambanan, Borobudur, Ayutthaya, and, and Sukhothai. Heritage and heritage management became synonymous with these monuments. In the Philippines, formal ar archaeology did not start until the shift to the American educational system. The country's archaeological tradition has been heavily influenced by Americanist archaeology since the early 20th century. However, most archaeological investigations in the country were and continue to be influenced by the culture historical approach. Victor Paz argues that the culture history approach contributes to nationalist archaeology and has its utility in strengthening Filipino nationalism. The nationalist archaeology approach, we argue, um, enables and reaffirms the hegemony of the Tagalog. The, the dominant ethno-linguistic group who traditionally inhabit Manila and adjacent region, um, their dominance in Philippine historiography. This is detrimental to most of the diverse ethnic groups in the Philippines. This approach has exoticized minority indig indigenous groups in the country by portraying them as remnants of the past while highlighting the modernity of the Tagalogs. The predominance of the culture historical approach in the Philippines has its roots from centuries of colonialism and socio-political and economic instability that followed independence. Outside of academia, archaeology plays an important role in legitimizing claims of sovereignty and generating capital from heritage tourism. 
Examples of these are the Marcos era state sponsored research on the Sadai hoax, the use of Manungul images in national iconography, and the Butuan vote in Balangay research. These research programs provide recognition of the archaeology and deep history of the Philippines, but there needs to be a broader focus on highlighting diversity. As exemplified in the Sadai hoax, the trap of romanticizing the past by looking for authentic pre-colonial Philippine cultures is real. Understanding the deep past is important, but it should not be the basis of national pride. For instance, our, our archaeological tradition is still heavily invested in reconstructing pre-colonial society, so much that pseudo-nationalists appropriate the narrative to talk about authentic and original Filipino culture. Philippine archaeology has to contend with the colonial foundations of the discipline in the country and the hegemonic status of the three-age system in the region. The three-age model was developed for Scandinavia and imposed to Southeast Asia through its application in Northeast Thailand archaeological record particularly the reference to the Bronze Age and the farmer-led migration in island Southeast Asia and the Pacific. Recent, archeolo recent archeological data now refute these models. 30 years of bioarchaeological investigations in Northeast Thailand and Central Thailand have consistently found patterns that challenge assumptions of the tree age model. For example, rice farming appeared long after the supposed Bronze Age. In the Philippines, the supposed Neolithic migration by rice farmers is repudiated by the absence of wet rice in the archaeological record that predates the 16th century. Thus, the archaeological record is pushing back against the imposition of this Eurocentric model. Even European archaeologists were critiquing the three age system by the 19th century in spite of their use of it, and New World archaeologists rejected the system. In Southeast Asia, Kanjana John Thorne allude to the hegemony of the three age system as a struggle of periodization because of the scientific illusion attached to the model. In the Philippines, this is reflected in the dominant chronology and the ever increasing polemic espoused by the farmer migration model. As Joyce White argued, these essentialist frameworks need to be supplanted by forward facing emergent paradigm Doing so allows us to devote far less time to worrying about origins and focus instead on understanding process and incorporating indigenous perspectives in archaeological interpretations. The conventional chronology used by many in the Philippines is presented in, in this slide, initially proposed by H. Otley Beyer in 1947 and refined by Robert Fox in 1970. Bayer attributed the changes in Philippine cultures through migration and overlooked internal factors. His descriptions were detailed that each period was subdivided into several phases. Fox refined his chronology and has become the basis for the Philippines. The use of proto in protohistoric period implied an earlier form of history, um, belittling or reducing the events during this period and emphasizing the historical period when written accounts exist. Earlier Chinese accounts such as Chao Chu Kua in 2025 do exist. Labeling the Spanish arrival as the beginning of the historical period promotes the colonist role in the creation of Philippine history. The long Spanish colonial experience obscured indigenous Philippines, but it was a different story during the American colonization where the official policy was to showcase the uncolonized indigenous groups. This was in display at the 1904 St. Louis World Exposition, where the juxtaposition of non-Christianized groups with the Lowland Constabulary Band was used as justification for American colonization of the Philippines through the view that non-Western peoples need to be civilized. This was articulated by the white man's burden perception this proceeded through the benevolent assimilation policy of the American colonial government. The St. Louis World Exposition catalyzed American influence in Philippine scholarship, particularly the development of history curricula and archaeological research. The event helped facilitate the recognition of the Philippines in the American consciousness. 
It also improved public support in the continued American occupation of the country. As part of the benevolent assimilation policy, the 1904 St. Louis World Fair set the so-called savages next to Christianized lowlanders who were playing Western musical instruments. It showed that colonialism worked and that the United States had the responsibility to help quote, uh, quote, savages reach civilization. This was the event that introduced Henry Otley Beyer to the Philippines. His appointment as a territorial anthropologist meant that he decided on the direction of archaeological research in the territory. The models that he espoused were used in history curricula, which are still largely used today. Other models proposed include F. Landa Hokano, who attempted to localize chronology, Bill Solheim, who argued for the disjunction between material culture and social cultural changes, and Sue Salazar, who proposed the Pantayam Pananao, or our perspective. Hokano, uh, who was the first Filipino to argue for a Philippine chronology removed from colonist perspectives, and this is his birthday today. He rejected the terms Bayer and Fox used and proposed new terms. Each phase was subdivided according to the dominant materials found, which would also reflect the lifestyle. Hukano acknowledged the persistence of materials despite the presence of new raw materials, demonstrating the reality that new materials do not end an age and cons consequently end the production and, and use of artifacts associated with an earlier period. A good example would be the lithic industries in the Tanhai region after the 10th century CE, when porcelains were flooding the local markets. Hukano called for new models that can reconcile indigenous patterns and exogenous structures, as well as integrate them into one sentiment supportive of our, of our national goal and that history should not be viewed from colonizers' perspectives. However, he still subscribed to the teleological Western definitions of civilization. Solheim, following Hokano's view, acknowledged that changes did not happen at the same time in all parts of the Philippines. Geographical areas have different experiences. He noted that changes in material culture do not necessarily reflect sociocultural changes, hence, People may be producing, using, and consuming new artifact types older, following older traditions without a clear comprehension why. But perhaps the first proposed chronology that integrates archaeology and history is Salazar's Pantayang Pananao, in our perspective, a concept that emphasizes a Filipino-centered perspective, like a Filipino speaking to another Filipino in a shared language. Like Tagalog speaking to a Tagalog, a Bicolano speaking to a Bicolano, um, so sharing in, in, in it their own languages. So Lazar's background in Philippine history, anthropology, and linguistics allowed him to come up with descriptions and analysis of past social and political organizations. The Pantayang Pananaw was a product of the resurgence of nationalism in the 1970s, a process that mirrors the self-reflective reflexive shifts in anthropology and psychology. Salazar's chronology is centered on decolonizing it from the history of, uh, from the discipline of history. Salazar emphasized that agency of the, local, of the locals against Spanish policies and rule. He argues that history is recorded in epics, legends, myths, songs, and other folk literature. Written history should not be given more credence than oral history, Salazar argues. Both sources are valid and both need cross-referencing. If oral history is modified through time and can be a collective account, written history is the same. It can also be multi-perspective and subjective depending on who is recording the events. Although not an example of the Pantayang Pananao or archaeological findings in Ifugao, appear to parallel Ifugao myths and community stories, particularly the lateness of wet rice cultivation and the migration to the interior of the, of the mountain range when the Spanish showed up. I summarize the Ifugao myth here. The Huua, or the sacred myths, tells of the story of the origin of the Ifugao. It details how the sky world Wigan, 
uh, the Sky World God Wigan of Gabunian sent his daughter Bugan and son Wigan to settle in Kiaman. So almost all of uh, Ifugao in, in, in the origin myth has the same name, either Wigan or Bugan. Um, an early valley by the banks of the great waters Kataplan. Their descendants spread out to all corners of the earth world that they call Pugao. However, due to various transgressions of the people, Wigan punished the earth world with a devastating flood. All but two, a boy and a girl whom he swept out to the highest mountain survived. From them shall come generations that would inhabit the earth anew. Several generations after the great flood, people once again flourished in the valley of Kiaman. They toiled the soil and hunted the forest for game. In one of their hunting trips, two brothers in pursuit of their quarry strayed in the realm of the people of the sky world. The accidental trespassing somehow turned into a feast with the hunters sharing cooked meat to the sky world people and the latter sharing a very strange rice which the brothers found most appealing. Being raw eaters, the people of the sky world found the fire which the brother used to cook the meat and rice, a novelty worthy of barter. But no amount of gold, jewelry, pigs, chickens, or sacred stories offered to the brothers would let them trade their knowledge of fire making for all these things they say they already have in their, in their village in Kiaman. Finally relenting, the sky world people offered their most precious rice for they know it was what the brothers wanted in their hearts. Fire for rice it is. But be forewarned noble children of the Pugao that this rice of the sky world comes with much hard work. You shall offer sacrifices to the gods with every new shoot, every new leaf from when you start toiling the earth and which you shall plant them until the ripening of the grains come harvest moon. And so it was, the brothers made haste down to their village in Kiaman, gathered their kin from both sides and started, started constructing the first paddy fields from their Sweden lands in Imbidai. They offered the sacrifices as required by the givers of the new rice and retold the story of how the white rice came to Kiaman. Soon after, Rice replaced taro in the fun fields. The old Kiangan village, which was, which was the site of our archeological excavations from 2012 to 2016, was the site of our work. Old Kiangan is mentioned in all origin myths and ritual incantations of the old Ifugao religion. Even living elders have only passed down stories from their grandparents. The old village where everything Ifugao originated, the cradle of culture, the birthplace of the Ifugao. Ritual specialists um, revere the place as the most hallowed of all Ifugao sacred grounds. Pinading, the earthbound nature spirits haunt its sanctified grounds, ever ready to prey on those of weak and soul stuff or mana. The village was the center of Ifugao resistance during the time of Spanish occupation of the lowlands, a launching pad for attacks on Spanish garrisons and lowland settlements. It was also a center for highland exchange as traders far from near and far had to pass through this crossroads of the highland trade route. Kiang and the old village is gone. The entire area has had been converted into a rice field at least two generations ago a few years after it was suddenly abandoned. No trace of its former self can be readily observed except for the seemingly misplaced flat river stones that have been piled up in the corners or used as stepping stones on paddy lines. These same stones were formerly used to tile house yards and walkways of the old village. A closer inspection, however, will reveal a rich deposit of broken potteries, even on the surface level. During our archaeological excavations, thousands of potsherds have been extracted from different trenches. A number of intact pots with infant remains have also been uncovered. The practice of jar burial for infants is still a recent memory for elderly Fugao, as the practice persisted until they stopped making their own pottery about 50 years ago. 
The practice of burying infants or stillborns under the house is still observed in some areas in present-day Ifugao without the pot. The custom is based on the old belief that burying the baby or the infant under the house will somehow keep it a secret from the deceiver gods, the cause of such tragedy. tragedy. No, cer no ceremonies are conducted, no animals are sacrificed, and mourning is not allowed for the death of the child. Funerary textiles that would normally shroud an, in an, Ifugao, an Ifugao dead are dispensed with. Doing otherwise will, will encourage the deceiver gods to take more unborn children as they great take great pleasure in the suffering of the people. The only material thing that the child is done with is a string of arm beads, an amulet to keep any soul snatcher at bay as it journeys alone to the afterlife. Jars and beads, local or imported, play the role in the life ways of the Ifugao. Nobles are bedecked in layers of gold and gold foil, carnelian, agate, or glass beads in the performance of their feasts of merit. They wear them during their funerals. Though being the ultimate utilitarian, imported beads, unlike textiles, were rarely buried with them. The soul stuff, or the mana of the material object, is bestowed on the departed through magical incantations during the burial rites. Same thing goes with the mandatory animal sacrifices, where the meat is consumed by the mortals and the soul stuff offered to the legions of our ancestors and divinities in the Ifugao Panchen. Pottery was a local merchandise among the, among the villagers of the old Kiangan. A neighboring village, Mungayang, less than a kilometer away, produced the finest earthenware potteries in the district until the craft was rendered obsolete by the influx of lowland merchandise during the American period. These earthenware ceramics were used as cooking pots and water containers. Imported tradeware, stoneware, and, and porcelain obtained from lowland, from lowland merchants were preferred as fermentation jars for the much prized rice beer, baya an essential commodity in rituals and community feasts. Stoneware jars are much more common, though less valuable, compared to Chinese porcelains. Porcelain jars have always been highly prized by the Fugao. Porcelain and, and stoneware jars have acquired purchase and redemption value, so much so that they were used as a currency to pay off debts, purchase rice fields, in exchange for slaves prior to the coming of the Americans. It, it is also an object of antiquity among the Ifugaos as they have evolved specific terms for particular designs. While the Ifugao generally associate these important porcelains to the Chinese as do their beads, the origin is not as important as the story that comes with it uh, on how it was passed down from ancestor so-and-so until it reaches the present possessor. The longer the story of, of its ancestral provenance, the more expensive it is. These porcelain jars are also kept within the family as much as possible and are bequeathed to newly married children as accessories to rice fields. The Fugao myths and community stories have helped us and the descendant communities make sense of the archeological record. The succeeding slides and discussion present our view on incorporating such information in a proposed framework to describe Philippine archaeology. We start with the recent hominin finds in Luzon. The myths of the oft-reputed waves of migration theory uh, developed by uh, uh, Spanish period um, scholars and refined by H. Otley Beyer in the early 1900s is yet to be broken. Although generations of scholars have argued against the lack of scientific support for the, for the Pipling model, not to mention its racist foundation, it continues to fascinate the general public's imagination. To incorporate recent paleoanthropological findings in the last decade, we propose that Philippine archaeology refer to the arrival of humans in the islands as the early humans period. This is characterized by the appearance of early hominins, particularly those that are represented by the Rizal Kalinga and the Kalo Cave finds. Archaeologically, this period is characterized by several stone tool complexes, although wood and bamboo usage potentially dominated the toolkit of these early hominins. 
To date, the Tabun Caves and Cagayan Valley remain the primary, primary localities of ancient human presence, such as the indirect evidence of butchering at about 700,000 years ago, a purported new human species labeled Homo luzonensis at 67,000 years ago, and new dates of 24 to 58,000 years ago for Tabuan human fossils. The intervisibility of Sunda Island, the, 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 uh, the region where most of island Southeast Asia was connected to mainland Southeast Asia, could have, been, could have facilitated the movement of, er, of these early humans. Early hominins found in Kalo Cave in northern, northeastern Luzon most likely crossed the open sea at 67,000 years ago. Based on the known Pleistocene sea levels in Southeast Asia, the parsimonious explanation is movement through the archipelago from Sunda. Shifting our focus away from technology, especially stone tool complexes, provides a broader understanding of early humans in the Philippines and the connections of these hominin finds with comparable finds in Southeast Asia, such as Homo fluorescensis. Using the earth early humans designation will also link the Philippines to the wider discussion of human origins and diversity of early Homo in or early hominins in Southeast Asia, not just as isolated finds. The period that succeeds the early humans is the clear break in the archaeological record that suggests an appearance of maritime cultures. In other models, this is referred to as the, to, as the Austronesian hypothesis. However, the focus on the so-called Austronesian speakers overlooks other life ways at that time. This period also shows a preponderance of shell tools that indicate the ability of the island populations or islands populations to access oceanic resources. Thus, distribution of shell tools signals increased maritime regional interactions and population movements thousands of years before the supposed Austronesian expansion. This period is also characterized by wide distribution of obsidian from the same geological source. Some cultures also started practicing flex burial traditions over a wide area. There was an active maritime network that can be argued to correspond to Solheim's Nusantau or maritime uh, culture, thousands of years before the claimed Austronesian migration. This period is considered by the dominant chronology as the Neolithic, where rice domestication is supposed to have appeared with a new cultural complex, the basis of Bellwood's out of Taiwan model. However, recent archeological data challenges this argument because of the total absence of wet rice evidence during this period up until uh, the 1600s. Thus, referencing intensified maritime interaction disengages the perception of the appearance of new cultural complex away from Bellwood's model and allows for multiple and broad subsistence scenarios, including mar marine exploitation. Hunting and foraging remain to be the main sources of food at this time, rather than rice cultivation. It was hypothesized that the Austronesian package composed of red slip pottery, stone adzes, notch pebble sinkers, baked clay, spindle whorls, nephrite ornaments, dog, pig, chicken, water buffalo, commensal rats, and rice agriculture moved as one, but to date, they have never been found together in one site. Recent finds in Mindanao also attest to the, root, to the use of root crops rather than domesticated rice and pottery all the, older than 4,000 years ago. At around 5,000 to 6,000 years ago, obsidian from Northern Mindanao, Sabah and Talaud Islands shared the same ge geological signature or rather geochemical signature. These objects contradict the conventional understanding of hunter gatherers as land bound. The documented use of shell and obsidian provides a link between ocean navigation, maritime interactions, and the Southeast Asian maritime culture. More importantly, identified Neolithic sites in the Cagayan Valley do not have evidence of rice. Rice was probably a, a prestige crop rather than a staple source of carbohydrates, and so were the pigs and dogs. 
that were consumed as prestige or ritual animals too. These findings thus suggest a shared culture rather than population replacement postulated by the Austronesian hypothesis. The introduction of domesticated plants and animals to the Philippines appeared to have been limited and slow, which is antithetical to the idea that a group of people with a suite of plants and animals from paging in the landscape eventually replaced local peoples in subsistence patterns. The archaeological data, however, suggests that, new, that the new group, the, the so-called Austronesians, adapted to the indigenous model of production that centered on the exploitation of root crops, the hunting of wild animals, and fishing in freshwater and marine contexts. The reference to the Austronesian hypothesis does not capture the diversity of archaeological complexes in the country or in the wider island Southeast Asia and, and, and the Pacific uh, uh, during this period. Rather, the Austronesian migration is an example of maritime travel over large distances, and their migration contributed to shared culture that we now see in the Philippines and in island Southeast Asia. The growth of communities founded on the shared maritime culture facilitated the emergence of burial practices that appear to represent the cosmology of the people during this time. In the standard Philippine chronology, this period is referred to as the metal age, even though there is no evidence of metal smelting during this time period. It is really defined by the manufacture and use of highly decorated and atypical pottery that are generally associated with burials, either as receptacles or votives. Thus, this period is characterized by elaborate burial traditions across the archipelago, including securely dated jar burial traditions. This elaborate burial tradition is rep represented by the Manungal Cave in Palawan, where iron was first documented. The reference to metal age is a misnomer that suggests forging of iron tools of web or web and weapons in the region. Rather, the introduction of Chris Chris swords and other iron tools show, shows the connection of the archipelago with the broader Southeast Asian chronology um, already globalized and hierarchical. Of course, oh, sorry. the appearance of metals characterizes this period, but focusing on the burial complexes and the associated pottery provide a better illustrative description of regional Filipino practices. The next period is the early historical period, which is characterized by the introduction of exotic or imported goods, which mainly trade ceramics and beads to the Philippines. From about 10th century CE until the 16th century, Intensive exchange between local populations and foreign traders have been documented. Tradeware refers to all types of imported, cer imported ceramics, including earthenware, stoneware, and porcelain. The standard chronology refers to this period as the porcelain age or proto-historic period. The high volume of tradeware in the archeological sites, including looted ceramics, demonstrate the extensive scale of regional trade during this period. Tang ceramics dated to between 1618 to 907 CE have been reported, but no publications have come out. Um, ceramic evidence from shipwrecks, archeological sites, and from private collections define a marked departure from the use of local pottery as burial receptacles, votives, and ritual paraphernalia. The introduction of foreign ceramics permeated the daily lives of the locals. They were used as grave goods, ritual items, identity markers, status markers, prestige, prestige objects, and wealth items, and as part of alliance building. But perhaps one of the most important aspects neglected in Philippine cultural history is the contribution of the Islamic contacts, starting at about 14th century CE. Islamic pilots and Muslim traders initiated the rapid spread of Islam in the region a century before Spanish colonization in the 16th century. The fact that the Spanish constructed numerous defensive baluarte or watchtowers as defensive structures against Moro raids affirmed to the role of, of Muslim groups during this period. 
It is thus our hope that more archaeological correlates could be discerned by future investigations to develop a more, in more inclusive Philippine chronology. The early modern period, which is between 1400 to 1830 CE, is characterized by the shift of the nature of trade from exchange to commerce. We follow Barbara and Leonard and Daya in characterizing this period where Southeast Asians were active players in the global phenomenon of expanding commerce as the recipients of both the positive and negative consequences of commerce. In the Philippines, this is distinguished by the appearance of sub subsequent conquest of the Spanish. Referring to the early modern period would bring Philippine chronology to regional historical discussions and break the arbitrary disciplinary boundaries. This period saw widespread landscape changes due to resource extraction and urbanization, the latter exemplified by stone and stone-based structures that started to emerge at around 1571 when uh, the Spanish pulled to Manila from, from Cebu. The internal urban landscape in the 1570s was based on the loss of the Indies, which was replicated across poblaciones or towns. The construction of churches, houses, forts, lighthouses, bridges, roadways, loading docks, and cemeteries transformed the physical and social landscapes. Town layout centered on the church and municipio simultaneously altered social relations. Stone and stone-based structures entailed quarrying, mining, and transport of raw materials, clearing of paths, creation of roads to allow transport to take place that were not reached via water. Preparation of binding agent and labor required to, sell raw material, required to source raw materials and to build the structures. These stone structures modified the social order based on ethnicity, wealth, and relig religious belief which became the foundation of the current Filipino society. Artifact-wise, Asian ceramics continued to dominate this period despite the Manila galleon trade that brought Mexican and European goods. Manila ware, a highly fired local pottery that appeared during the, this period, imitated European forms. Some groups, such as those inhabiting the Cordilleras of Luzon and Mindanao, resisted the colonial system and were argued to have been uncolonized. This mindset perpetuates discrimination because they were not civilized and Christianized. Recent work demonstrates that the complex economic strategies of the Ifugao, the people that I work with, uh, to be actively part of the colonist network without being subjugated. The Fugao's political system was driven by feasting through the cons consumption of prestige resources, uh, rice and pigs. It's a consequence of colonial resistance. The reference to the early modern period signals the incorporation of autochthonous groups such as the Fugao to the increasing globalized world facilitated by resource extraction and maritime commerce. Barbara and Leonard and Daya consider 1830 as the end of the early modern period when Southeast Asia was faced with an abated change due to the pressures exerted by European imperialism. The complete dominance of European powers in the maritime trade gave rise to the modern period, which was also characterized by technological advances and political changes that greatly eroded the ability of Southeast Asians to negotiate mutually beneficial arrangements with European colonial administrators. So this proposed periodization, this, uh, the proposed this periodization described in this presentation is the first attempt at localizing Philippine culture, cultural chronology in the last 40 years. It also advocates for a regional chronology that breaks disciplinary boundaries. We call for the rejection of the tree aid system as applied to Southeast Asia. More importantly, we suggest using the reference deep history instead of prehistory as the term for history can refer to groups who have history but lack the means to record it, such as the Fugao, yeah, the, the group that I, I work with. Some terms in previous chronology should be retired due to their colonial implications and non-applicability given the current archeological data. An updated chronology with a broad working framework is proposed. The new terms references 
reference human behavior, visual cues, and express the essence of the period. These proposed periods have also have the potential to break disciplinary boundaries. As, it, as emphasized earlier, robust radiocarbon modeling and statistical clustering are needed to link observed human behavior and arti artifactual patterning. Data integration should also be complemented by local and regional patterning to illustrate social change rather than the focus on typological evolution of artifacts. It is through these relationships that humans negotiate with other cultural groups, adapt to the physical world, and connect with the spir spiritual world. Hence, we can understand cognitive and behavioral complexities, technological, social, and cosmological activities through time. The proposed chronology emphasizes agency of past populations through space and time. It avoids a typological cl classification of artifacts, but utilizes an approach that seeks to look at meanings of objects. Informed by multiple data sets, we can track how early inhabitants made their way through life and death. Persistence of forms and raw materials should be appreciated in their new context, rather than consi considering them as anomalous. This attempt to create new labels for Philippine chronology build on fast research because this is how science works. Filling the gaps and demand for answers are good motivations to do research. Proposing a new chronology is an academic exercise, but should be made relevant by incorporating locals understandings of the, lo of the archaeological evidence. The core of archaeology is community from excavation, analysis, interpretation, and dissemination. Current archaeological practice involves different sectors of the local, public, and academic community that enrich the discipline. We emphasize the importance of community engagement, especially since historical knowledge in the Philippines is still largely a colonial legacy. We propose that community involvement is vital in the dissemination of new knowledge. In our work, this is highlighted by community skepticism of the younger dating of the rice terraces, especially when all tourism brochures and history textbooks celebrate the old antiquity of the agricultural fields. We also explore the colonial legacies of knowledge construction and, and how this knowledge becomes ingrained into people's ideas of the past. In the case of the Philippines, archaeological models proposed at the turn of the 20th century by American archaeologists and, and anthropologists have been difficult to demystify. In this presentation, we present the importance of collaborating with descendant communities and in incorporating their perspectives in the interpretation of the archaeological record, which has contributed to a serious consideration of the dominant conceptions of history and history making in the Philippines. Thank you.